order to properly evaluate the results of one or another process, you must first understand what goals the organizers and participants set for themselves. The actions of armies are not always aimed at the destruction of the enemy, while the signing of a diplomatic agreement or a truce can turn out to be a bluff. The Minsk Memorandum of 2014 stipulated a complete ceasefire and the withdrawal of heavy armaments from the front line. But clearly that was only on paper. The parties agreed to the terms of the agreement, but the war did not end. In the winter of 2015, the Armistice Peace Treaty was re-signed at the highest level, but within a few hours after the agreement entered into force, it was violated. You are watching the 61st episode of the program about the ATO, History of the War. In 2014, the Russian Federation committed an act of armed aggression against Ukraine. The war has been ongoing for several years, and we have been hot on the trail of the events in the course of this war, and we are tracing the links between military operations, diplomacy, politics and economics. We are trying to understand how it was and what was the purpose. The notion of peace is different for everyone. Launching the peace initiatives, the Ukrainian leaders sought to gain time to reinforce the army and strengthen the state. The West is interested in the integrity of the Ukrainian gas transport system, as well as the safety of nuclear power plants and similar hazardous production facilities. At the same time, according to the Russian scenario, this is the return of Ukraine under the control of the Kremlin. But despite the declarations and statements, Moscow was not satisfied with the truce signed in Minsk. On August 3, 2015, the environs of the Stanitsa Luhanska and the forward positions of the Ukrainian troops in the area of the Bakhmut Highway were the main hotspots in the Luhansk direction. Hiding themselves from the OSCE observers, the Russian-backed militants adhered to the tactics of launching powerful mortar attacks during the night time. At the same time, in the Donetsk direction, the Russian-backed militants actively used tanks in the daytime and then heavy artillery of the 152 caliber after sunset. On the night of August 3rd to 4th, 2015, three Ukrainian soldiers were killed as a result of shelling of the Ukrainian military positions in the area of Horlivka. In the area of the Donetsk International Airport and the western part of Donetsk, the battles were conducted practically on a 24-7 regime. Having placed fire weapons in urban areas, the Russian-backed militants fired at the Ukrainian positions without fear of opposition, and in the end that resulted in the mass destruction of objects of the local civilian infrastructure. In the southern part of the ATO zone, Ukrainian positions in the area of Starohnatyvka fell under heavy mortar and artillery attacks. Though the situation was relatively calm in the south of Pavlopil, it should be understood that such peace has quite prosaic reasons. Unlike the suburbs of Donetsk, the Azov Sea region is highly populated, so the Russian-backed militants, who hid in urban areas and fired at Ukrainian positions, were fired at by return fire from Ukrainian troops. On August 5th, the situation in the ATO zone practically did not change. As a result of the shelling of the town of Shastya, two soldiers of the 92nd Brigade were wounded. It should be noted that keeping the state of ceasefire in the south in the area of Mariupol, the militants actively fired at the Ukrainian positions in the area of Orlivka and Donetsk. Three reconnaissance officers of the 74th Battalion were killed on mines in the area of Karlivka, another soldier was killed in Marinka, and seven other soldiers were wounded. That day there were heavy artillery attacks. The Ukrainian positions were fired upon for an hour and a half near the village of Rosatka, 
which is situated on the Svetlodarsk bulge. As usual, the Russian backed militants shot at random. Several shells fell 12 kilometers behind the front line. In total, heavy weapons were fired at least 30 times on this day. Here it is worth noting that the return firing of the Ukrainian artillery was quite limited. In some cases, the soldiers were disconcerted because they were forbidden to fire back at the enemy. But the fact is that by conducting a policy of peace and declaring the desire for a ceasefire at all costs and levels, the Ukrainian side disrupted the dastardly plans of the Kremlin. After all, Putin is not interested in peace. In the terms of compliance with the regime of silence, the so-called protection of the Russian-speaking population loses its significance. If Ukraine does not shoot, if the genocide promised by Russian propaganda does not occur in the previously liberated cities of Kramatorsk and Mariupol, then there is no need for the presence of Russian troops there. Because of the rising level of unemployment, the discontent of the local population is on the rise. And in order to divert the population from everyday problems, the old and proven method of waging war is applied. And the fact is that war is the way of deception and hybrid provocations. On August 6, a spontaneous rally took place near the headquarters of the OSCE mission in Donetsk. Citizens, allegedly dissatisfied with the work of observers, expressed their distrust and sprayed paint on 30 vehicles. After the incident, Principal Deputy Chief Monitor of the OSCE mission Alexander Hook stated his intentions of limiting his activities in the Donetsk Oblast due to the pressure that was put on observers of the OSCE mission. It is interesting to note that a lot of Russian-backed militants were noticed among the protesters, including including the commandant of the town of Snizhne, Serhii Hodovanin, nicknamed Weyer. Waging a war is very costly. In the terms of the Minsk peace agreements, the OSCE became an instrument of pressure on Russia through its Western business partners. The presence of the observers literally tied the hands of the Russian-backed militants. This meant that the Russian military machine could not work at full speed and power, which in fact equalized the strength of the Kremlin's hybrid army with the capabilities of the Ukrainian army. So it is quite logical that the Kremlin sought to get rid of unnecessary eyes on the situation in the Donbass by means of applying personal and collective pressure on the observers. After all, one can argue that the Russian-Ukrainian war is not only about the battles in the ATO zone. The war is a complex process. In the cold phase, this confrontation is along the entire Russian-Ukrainian border as well as within the country. On August 6, three Russian reconnaissance drones were noticed flying over the northern part of the state border. In the area of the village of Bakhmutivka, the officers of the Security Service of Ukraine detained a citizen of Russia who arrived to Ukraine with the intention of joining the ranks of the Russian-backed militants. Another soldier with apparently similar intentions was seized and detained in Rubizhne. In the ATO zone, the overall situation remained the same. In the area of Shastya and the Sanitsa Luhanska, the militants used mainly small arms. The sabotage and reconnaissance enemies' groups acted in this area, but the Ukrainian side also conducted reconnaissance of the enemy's positions. The outskirts of Donetsk became a hot spot again. In this area, the militants used the full package of arms with a high caliber of 122mm. In the area of Avdiivka, two soldiers of the 93rd Brigade were killed by shelling and another soldier of the 25th Brigade was killed as a result of a car bomb attack. In the area of Krasnohorivka, in evening twilight, a group of about 20 enemy soldiers attacked the Ukrainian stronghold. The battle lasted for an hour and a half. As a result, the enemy retreated. And in the area of the village of Troitske, ignoring the peace agreements, the Russian-backed militants used GRAD MRLS. On the night of August 7, a local resident was wounded as a result of shelling in Avdiivka. The militants fired at the village of Shaste using small arms. As a result, three soldiers of the 92nd Brigade were wounded. Stanitsa Luhanska, Zolote III and Papasna were subjected to artillery shelling, which resulted in damage of four residential buildings. Having reduced their activity in the Donetsk direction, the militants reactivated in the north and south of the ATO zone. In the area of Troitske, they fired 120mm caliber mortars and grabbed multiple launch rocket systems. At the same time, on the Svitlodarsk bulge, the artillery subsided and the snipers activated. 
On August 7th, officers of the Security Service of Ukraine conducted an exchange of prisoners. Three Ukrainian soldiers managed to be exchanged for six militants, two of whom were citizens of the Russian Federation. On the same day, OSCE spokesman Michael Batsurkiv stated that from the beginning of May, in the course of their work, observers made contacts with people who openly declared their involvement in the Russian armed forces on eight occasions. On August 7th, in the area of Trohizbenka, while performing a combat task, a group of reconnaissance officers of the 92nd Brigade was captured by the militants. When the militants convoyed the prisoners through the minefield to their positions, one senior soldier, Chepalenko, pushed a militant into a tripwire. As a result of the explosion, Oleg Chepalenko, warrant officer Mikola Ostotsky and two militants were killed. On the night of August 8, the artillery weapon of calibers prohibited by the Minsk agreements was used 12 times. During the shelling of the Ukrainian checkpoint near the town of Shestia, two Ukrainian soldiers were wounded. However, the area around Donetsk was the most intense hotspot, where small arms and grenade launchers of 152mm caliber were constantly fired. In the area of Orlivka, Russian-backed militants activated firing at the Ukrainian positions by using GRAD multiple launch rocket systems. It eventually led to the injury of three residents of Toretsk and the damage of the power supply lines. A part of the city was cut off from power and about 200 miners were blocked in the mine. Despite the fact that only one firefight was recorded in the area of Mariupol, in this zone the Ukrainian army suffered irretrievable losses. One soldier of the 51st Marine Infantry Battalion of Ukraine was killed in the battle with the enemy reconnaissance team. In total, nine soldiers were wounded on August 8. On August 9, the situation seriously escalated in the area of Stanitsa Luhanska. Militants bombarded the city with mortar shells during the night, morning and that evening. And it was noted that the firing was executed from the border of Luhansk from the area of Chervoni Yar. This circumstance extremely complicated the counteraction. It is noteworthy that the ceasefire regime was put into effect in the neighboring Shastya, but in the area of the Bakhmut Highway, the Ukrainian positions came under fire twice. In the area of Krimske, one soldier of the 24th Brigade was killed by enemy fire. On the same day, the village of Vidradivka, which is 11 kilometers from the contact line, suffered from the firing of Russian heavy artillery. The village of Nevelska to the west of Pisky was subjected to the same firing, a result of which three local citizens suffered. Using their unofficial status, the Russian-backed militants attacked any targets. The issue of the safety of the civilians and the destruction of the civilian infrastructure was practically not important for the militants. Intelligence of the targets, remote from the front line, was carried out with the help of unmanned flying vehicles and the assistance of help of agents that were specially assigned to cover a near rear. On August 9, a Russian citizen who had served in one of the LPR intelligence units since December 2014 was detained in the vicinity of Stanitsa Luhanska. During the interrogation, the detainee testified that he participated in both Chechen wars, serving in the 76th and 106th Airborne Divisions of the Russian Air Force. However, formally at the time of his detention, the militant was listed as a soldier transferred to the reserve. Such a scheme with the dismissal of soldiers before being sent to the east of Ukraine or even in case of unforeseen situations is widespread in the army engaged in the hybrid war. The next day, the activity of the Russian-backed militants was enhanced along the entire front line. Besides that, by ignoring all these signed agreements, the militants actively used both non-rocket artillery and rocket artillery. That led to the use of fire through Ukrainian artillery systems. On the night of August 10, 2015, in the south of the ATO zone, east of Starohnatyvka, in the area of Bilokamenka Starolaspi, an operation under the code name Black Rock was launched. It was the beginning of a so-called creeping offensive of the Ukrainian army, and the front line moved eastward. <laughs>